Hi, Ben. Hi. Hi. Uh, can we do a quick screen share check for you before yes. other folks join in? Perfect. It's coming yeah. up. Excellent. Thank you, Ben. Thanks. It's right at 930, but I'm going to give people a couple of minutes to join in and then we'll get started, but we're already recording. Um, I can actually pause the recording for a second. All right. Welcome, everyone. Um, thank you for attending our first session of this year's Applied Ecology Minors Research Symposium. We have four students presenting this morning, and we have additional presentations scheduled for today at 2.30 p.m., as well as on Monday at 2.30 p.m. So I hope that you'll come back and join us for those sessions as well. Um, each of our four presenters has uh, prepared a 10 to 12 minute presentation for us. They'll be sharing their screens. After each presentation, we'll have a short three to five minute question and answer period. And please make note of your questions during the presentation and then ask them during that question and answer period um, at the end of the presentation. And if you'd like to ask a question at that time, we have the chat box, which um, some of you have already found, but you can put questions in the chat box there and it'll be sent to all of the participants as well as the panelists, the presenters. Um, or you can ask in the chat box to be unmuted and you can ask a question that way as well. Just let me know through the chat box that you'd like to do that. We ask that during the presentations, um, only the presenter turn on their camera. Um, that will help the, the viewers. So only keep your camera on while you're presenting, please. And then finally, we are recording today's session um, for those who might not be able to join. So. With that, we will go ahead and get started with our students' presentations. And first up, we have Molly Niekamp, and Molly is presenting on the urban influence of Eastern box turtle movements. So without further ado, I'll hand it over to Molly. All right, hey guys, let me go ahead and share my screen with you. Can everyone see that okay? Yes, Molly, looks good. Okay, all right, well, I'm gonna get started then. So, hey everyone, uh, my name is Molly Niekamp and I'm a junior majoring in environmental science and I'm minoring in applied ecology, biological sciences, wildlife science, and zoology. I conducted my research on the influence of urbanization of Eastern box turtle movements in North Carolina. And I completed this research during my wildlife conservation internship with the Piedmont Wildlife Center in Durham, North Carolina. So uh, just a little background information on Eastern box turtles. Um, they are a terrestrial turtle species that lives primarily in the Eastern United States. And this species moves very slowly, takes long to mature, lives a very long life and does not produce many offspring per year. And unfortunately, these characteristics make this species susceptible to the many dangers of urban sprawl and habitat fragmentation. Um, and this includes things like road collisions, run-ins with agricultural machinery, and also contact with pets. Um, and these have greatly increased the mortality of the species in the last decade. And in 2011, actually, the International Union for Conservation of Nature upgraded the conservation status of this species from near threatened to vulnerable, as their natural populations continue to decline across the Eastern US. Um, and these turtles are also quite visually appearing or visually appealing with their vibrant colored eyes and their interesting shell pattern, which has made them a target of pet trade. And I actually included a picture of Bob the box turtle in this presentation. He's one of our ambassador animals at Piedmont Wildlife Center. And he is also very vibrantly colored with his red eyes and orange skin. He's a very handsome young man. And uh, thousands of Eastern box turtles are taken every year from the wild and used for pet trade which further decreases the long-term viability of the remaining wild turtle populations. And a uh, fun fact, fox turtles are also the North Carolina state reptile, and they are the only terrestrial turtle species in the state. So seeing as this species is so spread out across the state in a lot of varying environments, we have yet to fully understand the differences between these populations 
and the various threats that they face. And you can see in this map I included uh, from the North Carolina GAP analysis project displaying Eastern box turtle range. Um, we still lack a pretty general understanding on how their populations are dispersed throughout the state. And that also means that we have yet to really accurately measure their ecosystem value and what it may mean for other native species if this one disappears. And because of these factors, the scientific community studying box turtles has a very strong need for baseline data uh, on population size for the uh, future long-term monitoring purposes. So um, the research that I completed was part of a long-term study called the Box Turtle Connection Project. And this is all over the whole state of North Carolina. And the goal of this project is to study Eastern box turtle behavior and trends in natural populations to better understand how to protect them. And I specifically studied the movement of Eastern box turtles in more urban areas, such as the Durham Chapel Hill area, and how living in such a fragmented area affects the species. Um, I hypothesized that the surrounding urbanization of the area was negatively impacting the movement of the studied population, as there are many anthropogenic dangers present nearby, and this includes Interstate 40, um, a lot of nearby growing neighborhoods and a heavy recreational use of the study area. Um, you can see this map I included in the presentation um, and it shows the general study area where each of the six turtles have a home range. And the entire area is located within Lay Farm Park. Um, this is where Piedmont Wildlife Center operates and conducts their Eastern box turtle research and educational programs. You can see how the interstate and adjacent apartments are within a very close proximity to the study area. And there's also a small neighborhood situation situated on Trenton Road in Yale Lane. Uh, so to measure the turtle movement and specific conditions, I tracked each turtle using a radio receiver. You can see that picture in the bottom right. And on the property, we currently have six turtles outfitted with transmitters that are tracked on a weekly basis. And each turtle has its own channel tuned into the receiver. So I use visual and sound cues from the receiver um, to locate the exact location of each turtle throughout the property. And every time I locate a turtle, I record the ground temperature, air temperature, sky coverage, specimen visibility, and northing and easting measurements. Uh, this data is also entered into a GPS where the locations of each turtle are recorded on a map. And once all of the data is collected, it is entered onto an online database to be shared with other members of the Box Turtle Connection Project. Um, and specifically for my research, I only focused on the location measurements. So here's my results page. Um, this graphic shows the distance traveled by each box turtle over the study period where I began my research. And this is from February 6th to April 12th. Um, and like I said earlier, this study is currently ongoing. So this graph is not complete and I will continue collecting data into the month of May. Um, we can still observe some overall trends from the study period so far. There is a pretty noticeable dip in movement activity towards the end of March in four of the six turtles in the study, uh, which definitely raised some questions about what factors might be contributing to these distinct results. Um, and based on the normal home ranges for each of these turtles, I'm led to believe that park use of visitors and camp members may have had an influence on box turtle movement during this period of study. So Lay Farm Park, where the study is conducted, is actually a very popular disc golf site in Durham. And two of the turtles, AOW and Cho, that experienced a decrease in movement have a home range within a very short distance of these disc golf trails. And the other two turtles that experienced a decrease in movement during this time period, which are CIK and AKV, are within a very close proximity of the sites in the park frequently used by children of the Piedmont Wildlife Center camp program. So park recreational use tends to um, increase in the month of March usually which may explain the very sudden decrease in movement in park maintenance through mowing, um, has also shown to have a direct impact on turtle activity. And this also tends to increase during the springtime. And you can also see after this, there's an upward spike in box turtle movement around early April. Um, and that was an expected observation as this marks the beginning of the East, Eastern box turtle breeding season. So I began my research during the colder months and these colder months are the kind of year or time of year we observe brumation in eastern box turtle populations, which means they burrow underground and their body activity and process is slow to help them conserve energy and they're basically in a deep sleep. And they come out of brumation between the months of April and May. And during this time, we tend to observe greatly increased movement um, as the weather warms. And you can tell these eastern box turtles are coming out of brumation in that dramatic spike right in early April. Oh, skip the slide. 
Hold on, let me try to go back, I'm sorry. All right, so when analyzing my data, um, I turned to box turtle physiology uh, to try to explain my results. So of all of their sense organs, the eyes of the Eastern box turtle species are actually one of their most important organs as Eastern box turtles rely on their eyesight for mating purposes and to navigate their home range. Um, they actually have colored vision and can see clearly both during daytime and nighttime. And they're also sexually dimorphic, which means males and females exhibit different uh, physical characteristics based on their gender. Um, and in this graphic on the right, you can see a female Eastern box turtle that is characterized by her brown eyes, her round carapace and her short tail. So Eastern box turtles use their superior vision to seek out mates, um, which they use these characteristics to identify by, um, like the shell shape, eyes, and overall color. Um, and they also use this vision to remember their home ranges, which is important for resource access. And so seeing as this species is so reliant on visual cues, uh, I believe that seeing increased presence of recreational users of Lay Farm Park is likely what made the box turtles experience a distinct decrease in movement towards the end of March. Um, and of course, small children um, are especially likely to interact with these turtles and with their curiosity to get, to get the best of them. And the start of camps in the park may be the leading cause of the movement decline. And this data somewhat supports my hypothesis regarding human influence negatively impacting Eastern box turtle movement, but it's very difficult to decipher what external factors did and did not affect these turtles. And uh, originally when the study began, there were actually eight turtles. Um, but two were lost during the study. One unfortunately disappeared during the construction of a neighborhood adjacent to the park. And another turtle close to the road mysteriously dropped its receiver and was never found. Um, these situations demonstrate how humans can have a pretty direct impact on Eastern box turtle populations. So um, while I can't really confidently confirm the validity of my results I've observed so far, I think it's pretty safe to say that humans pose a dire negative impact on uh, wild eastern box turtle populations. And we still have a lot to learn about this species physiology and how this differs among, among the various populations across the east coast. And based on my findings, I believe that these turtles are very visually sensitive and we need to look more into how observed human activity may influence box turtle activity. And this also raises a really important point about uh, Eastern box turtle protections. So seeing as this species is still de in decline and very sensitive to urbanization, are we really doing enough to protect box turtles? Um, at what point in the species decline do we decide to cut off inhabited areas of recreational use? So we definitely need a lot more research on how recreational use affects Eastern box turtle home ranges. Um, so we need to do the, this research to weigh the costs and benefits of such a big decision. Um, and I really hope that the box turtle connection is able to look more into habitat protections of eastern box turtles and they can collect more baseline data on the subject. And as I continue the study and collect more data, I'm really hoping to get some clear answers on how the, the use of Lay Farm Park is impacting the local box turtle population. All right, so I really want to thank Noelle Dollhouse for giving me the wonderful opportunity to take part in the box turtle connection research project. And I really also want to thank Jenna Williams and Grace Bowman for their mentorship and patience during my time at Piedmont Wildlife Center as an intern. Um, and even though she's not on the slide, I really want to thank Professor McKinney. Um, she's actually the one that introduced me to this position. So I definitely would not be here today without her. All right, do we have any questions? Great, thank you so much, Molly. And I'll let yeah. people go ahead and, and put some questions um, in the chat box or they can ask to, to turn on their mics. One question that I had while we're waiting. So Molly, you talked a lot about the human influence on this population and it made me wonder to what extent you communicated with the public about this project or what opportunities you would see as this work continues to engage um, public audiences in this work. Yeah, so um, during my time at Piedmont Wildlife Center, um, I've worked on a couple of outreach events and based on um, what I've observed communicating with the public, people have um, not much general knowledge on this species. Um, seeing as they're one of the only terrestrial turtle species in the state, people um, are surprised by this. And um, there's been a couple times where people have rescued turtles and put them in bathtubs, which is what you're not supposed to do. Um, so there's definitely a need um, for public education on this, seeing as uh, humans are the biggest threat to Eastern box turtles. And um, we started doing more outreach programs based on the box turtle connection. 
Um, and we also feature a citizen science program where people are allowed to assist with our mark recapture study. Um, if they find Eastern box turtles, they have a certain photo protocol they can use to photograph the box turtles so we can locate them um, throughout the different counties, Wake County, Orange County. Um, and that allows people to get involved um, and care a little bit more about our, uh, our purpose. All right, I think I have another question. In the yeah, chat. thank you, Molly. All right, so someone asked, um, from what I've learned and observed so far, what strategies do I think might help mitigate the impact of human recreational uses of the parks? Um, that is a really good question. Um, I think we need to have better signage in our parks where these uh, Turtles of Home ranges for sure. Um, I think that's one thing Lay Farm Park really lacks. Um, I know uh, sometimes you go to a park and there'll be warnings, you know, watch out for snakes, things like that. But I really think we need to extend that to protected species, especially since uh, box turtles are currently listed as vulnerable by the IUCN. Um, I really think we could use signage in such heavily used parks, especially since Lay Farm Park is used heavily for disc golf. Um, so I definitely think some increased signage could help people learn more about this and know not to mess with the turtles. Is there anything else? Great, Molly. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for your presentation and for your research on this. Yeah, thank you guys for listening. All right, we will, um, I think it's right at time to move on to our next student presenter. So we have uh, Caitlin Poplaski, and Caitlin will be presenting on nutrient distributions across varying hydro periods. So I'll turn it over to Caitlin now. Thank you. Hello. Okay, can everyone see this? Yes, Caitlin looks good. Okay, cool. So hello, my name is Caitlin Poplaski and my research project looks at the nutrient distributions in animals across three different hydroperiod types. So it's important to know where most nutrients are located among these three hydroperiods and how they're distributed among taxa within them to better understand the possible implications of climate change, which is causing a shift in community composition, as well as a shift towards more temporary ponds, which would lead to a reduction in biodiversity and biomass, and therefore a possible reduction in nutrient supplies if the more permanent ponds contain more nutrients. So that's mostly what we were looking at here to see which ponds had the most nutrients and then also which taxa within those ponds had the, had the most nutrients. Understanding which taxa contributes the most nutrients is also important for recognizing which taxa may be crucial to the health of the health of the ecosystem. So what is currently known is from Dr. Bailey's paper, we currently have data on biomass, excretion, and nutrient supply by animals, as well as data on supply and demand for nitrogen and phosphorus. And from the biomass data, we know which hydroperiod has the most biomass as well as the highest has the highest diversity, which is the permanent ponds. And for this project, I specifically looked at the content of nitrogen and phosphorus in the body of various taxa across all three hydroperiods. And then combining it with the biomass data, this contributes to knowledge about where and how much nutrients are stored in these ponds. What's still unknown is how much of each nutrient is stored in non-animal materials and how that data fits into the bigger picture of where all nutrients in a pond are located and whether most nutrients are located in animal materials or non-animal materials. The questions asked in this project um, were how nutrient distributions varied across hydro periods, as in which ponds hold the most nutrients, which taxa contributes the most nutrients, and whether biomass or the body stoichiometry, so the percent nutrient in the body, um, better explains the distribution of these nutrients. My hypotheses included that the longer hydro periods would have larger quantities of nutrients overall because they house more diversity and larger biomass. Um, and also things that live in permanent ponds can live there longer, grow larger, and then possibly contribute more nutrients such as salamanders. Um, I also thought that the taxa contributing the most nutrients would likely have a high biomass, but also that some taxa that don't have a high biomass could still contribute a decent amount to the nutrients stored in that pond due to high percentages of that nutrient in their body. So this is just a map showing the numerous ponds of various hydroperiods from which many samples of the various taxa were taken. Um, I did not collect these, they were collected previously. 
and I was just using these samples to do further research in this project. Um, and I used them to do an analysis of the phosphorus content in the body, but these uh, were collected via net sweeps in the Mexican Cut Nature Preserve in Colorado. So along with the samples to analyze for phosphorus that were provided to me, I was also provided with the nitrogen data already um, and just conducted further research to answer my research questions with that data and then the data that I collected in the lab. So for phosphorus analysis, I weighed out an appropriate amount of each sample, ashed them, and then cooked them in a water bath, and then added a working reagent to be able to do spectrophotometry to then record the absorbance amounts and interpret through linear regression in Excel um, the percent E in the body of each sample. And this took several weeks because uh, we had to do it in several different batches because there were quite a few samples. Um, Later, the biomass data from Dr. Bailey's paper was used and multiplied by the percent P and percent N data um, to get the total amount of storage in each taxa as well as in each hydro period. And a resampling model was used when working with the data and we were able to see major differences with little variation around the estimates, but uh, more formal tests, tests will need to be done in the future. So this is the first set of graphs for the permanent ponds. And I would like to note that on each of the graphs, the nutrient storage is on the y-axis and the animal taxa are on the x-axis. And the taxa are also ranked so that the taxa containing the most amount of nutrients appears first and it goes from left to right. Um, salamanders and chironomids contain the highest amount of both nutrients in permanent ponds with salamanders contributing 39% of the total amount of nitrogen stored in the pond and 62% of the total phosphorus and then chironomids contain 27% of the total nitrogen and 25% of the total phosphorus. And then another major group for nitrogen was the caddisflies contributing 23% of the total. And this is pretty significant just because there's a few major taxa that contribute over half of the nutrients stored in that pond. And then the rest of it is pretty evenly spread in minuscule amounts throughout the rest of the taxa that are there. Um, the majority of the nitrogen and phosphorus were stored in only two of the three major taxa. There are two or three, as we can see, there's three major ones labeled on each, and then the rest are pretty small amounts. Um, and salamanders and chironomids both have high biomass in this pond, which helps explain their large contribution of nutrients. But salamanders also have high percent N and P in their body, which explains why they contribute more of each nutrient than chironomids, even though they have fairly similar biomass. So both biomass and body stoichiometry um, explained the high nutrient storage in permanent ponds from salamanders. So for the semi-permanent ponds, you'll notice that the scale on the semi-permanent and the temporary ponds um, get smaller as we go along because they contribute or have less nutrient storage. Um, and you'll see that the salamanders are still, the salamanders that were a large contributor in the permanent ponds are now absent from both the semi-permanent and the temporary ponds. So the taxa that contribute the most here has shifted to caddisflies and chironomids or beetles for phosphorus as well. So the taxa that contribute the most here, um, the caddisflies contribute 36% to nitrogen storage and only 10% to phosphorus while chironomids contribute 34% to nitrogen, but 53% to phosphorus. Again, the majority of the nutrients are contained in just a few taxa and the rest is pretty evenly spread in small amounts through the rest of the diversity in the pond. So we know that those taxa are really important to the nutrient storage and nutrient supply to these ponds. Um, and caddisflies and chironomids both have high biomass, which explains their high nitrogen contributions, but chironomids also have a higher percent P in their body, which explains why they contribute more P than caddisflies, even though they have similar biomass. So again, we can see that Biomass does play a role in how much storage uh, a taxa provides, but also um, the body stoichiometry plays a decent role because it, even if it has small biomass, if it has high percentage, it can still contribute a lot to that pond. So in the temporary ponds, there are even less nutrients available here. And there's also a lot less biodiversity. If you notice on the X axis, there's a lot less taxa listed. Um, Caddisflies have the highest or have high biomass here, and make up 70% of the total nitrogen in these ponds. And this large contribution is attributable to their high biomass. And then the rest of the nitrogen, as you can see, is pretty fairly and equally spread out between chironomids, beetles, mosquitoes, and zooplankton. 
And then phosphorus storage is also pretty evenly spread between five major taxa with mosquitoes contributing the most at 28% for phosphorus and then beetles second at 22%. Um, so mosquitoes are the major contributor, um, but they don't have a super high biomass. So the, their contribution to phosphorus is high mostly because of their high phosphorus content in their body. So overall, the nutrients stored for nitrogen and phosphorus amongst the ponds, uh, we can see that it's the most in permanent ponds and then it decreases drastically as you go to semi-permanent and then temporary, with temporary really having not that much nutrients in it to support the life, which is why there's less biomass and less biodiversity and they don't last as long. So nutrients tend to leave if the pond dries up um, because the animals leave and permanent ponds have the greater diversity in biomass, which contributes to higher mass, higher amounts of nutrients present. So the hypothesis that larger or longer hydro periods have more nutrients is supported. And while analyzing the results and looking at why certain taxa contributed more to the total amount of nutrients, it became clear that often if a taxa has large biomass, it will be a major contributor. But there are also instances where um, taxa with smaller biomasses are still major contributors because of the high nutrient content in the body. So the hypothesis that larger biomasses means larger contributions is mostly supported, but the alternative that body stoichiometry may better explain the contribution is also supported by some taxa. So this is an illustration of the four major taxa that contribute the most to the nutrient storage in a permanent pond. And we can see that the salamanders are by far the most major contributor um, in nitrogen and phosphorus. Uh, followed by chironomids and then caddisflies. And noting that the caddisflies and chironomids are also fairly high contributors is important because these are taxa found in semi-permanent and temporary ponds, but only salamanders are only found in permanent ponds. And when we move to more temporary ponds, those taxa or that taxa is lost. So the amount of nutrients in hydroperiod varies with the most being in permanent ponds due to high biodiversity and biomass and the percent nutrient body uh, also plays a role in which taxa contributes the most nutrients. So both biomass and body stoichiometry influences the amount of nutrients in the taxa and hydroperiods. And the biomass data, like I said before, came from Dr. Balik's paper, while the percent P data came from my work in the lab. Uh, results indicate that permanent ponds are important stores of nutrients in the ecosystem, and results show drastic decreases in nutrients as hydroperiods get shorter as well as com community composition changes across hydroperiods affecting the total amount of nutrients, as well as which taxa are contributing those nutrients in the pond. So as climate change causes shifts to more temporary ponds, we could choose see shifts in community compositions as species requiring long longer hydroperiods are lost, such as salamanders, and those taxa tend to be the ones that are important for nutrient storage, and therefore we tend to lose a lot of essential nutrients, which would have a negative impact on the ecosystem overall. So climate change is affecting the hydroperiod length, and so it's important to have the knowledge of where most nutrients are in the ponds and which taxa allow, and in which taxa, uh, which allows us to draw connections and gain an understanding of how climate change will affect nutrient distribution and availability in the environment. And some challenges I faced during this project were having to sort through and organize all the data as there were a lot of samples and then a lot of data coming in from other places. And making sure that the names of various taxa are consistent throughout <laughs> the record keeping really helps. Uh, when it comes to sorting everything and compiling data. And time is a big challenge trying to fit everything into one semester since anal analysis took a decent amount of time over the course of several weeks and then sorting through and analyzing the data as well as making graphs and interpreting everything we did as well. So future research to be done includes looking into the non-animal materials to get an idea of how much nutrients are stored there uh, compared to in the animal materials and help create a fuller picture of where all the nutrients in a pond are located. And tracking the effects of climate change on nutrient distribution and availability could also be done as we know that climate change is affecting hydro periods. And now we know that there is a very drastic difference between the nutrients in a permanent pond versus a temporary. I just wanna say thank you to my mentor, Dr. Brad Taylor and one of his postdoc students, Dr. Jared Baylick for helping me with this project and also receiving some data from Dr. Scott. Are there any questions? Great, thank you so much, Caitlin. You, 
while people are having the chance to put things in the chat, one of the questions I had is what was the experience like you spoke a little bit about this and the challenges, but having not been the one to collect data or to do the collection in the field, what was it like to come in to the research process at the stage that you did? Yeah, it was interesting, but it was cool because it came from a place that's so far from here. So obviously that's not something that I would have gone and been able to do. Um, but it was really cool being able to see all of the samples that were already like dried and ground up and ready to go. And then I just had to use those and weigh out the appropriate amount in the in the vials and then go from there. Um, it would have been cool to collect the samples too, but especially with time constraint, like it was a lot easier to have them already there for me to just go ahead and start doing the work with them. Thanks, Caitlin. Looks like you have a question that just came into the chat. Other than climate change, what other stressors could be affecting these ecosystems? Um, that's a good question. Um, I'm trying to think. So climate change is the main thing because it's um, decreasing the length of the hydro period, which is what's causing community shifts. So I guess other uh, pollution and things like that that are going to affect the nutrients by affecting the community composition, um, that would probably be something that affects the ecosystems because um, if we change the community composition, anything that's going to change the community composition is going to affect which nutrients are available based on which taxa are going to be available in that pond. So if that answers. Great. Thank, thank you so much, Caitlin. Well done. All right. I think we're um, at time now for our next presenter. And so I will turn it over to Ben Register, who will be presenting on searching for rock snot viruses. So Ben, take it away. Hi, everyone. I will go ahead and share my screen. Is that working? <clears throat> yes, looks good, Ben. Okay. All right. So my name is Ben Register. I'm a junior studying marine science and environmental science. And my project is called Searching for Rock Snot Viruses. I also worked with Dr. Brad Taylor studying this diatom seen on the left. It's called Didymosphenia geminata, um, or Didymo for short. And it is native to several parts of the United States, but recently it has become a nuisance um, by creating these extracellular stalks, as seen on the right. Um, a little bit about how it creates those stalks. We have here a picture of two cells that have just separated from one another. They have created this stalk that you can see underneath them. And then they separate and continue to branch out and separate more and more. Um, until you have something like this. This is a little clump of them. And all of those green speckles you can see here are the actual Didymo cells. And the white material is that stalk that they're creating. And then eventually they can create something like this. And so this is how they get their name, rock snot. Um, and this is what also how they become a problem. This stuff will cover entire river bottoms and it can affect the ecological communities. It can also affect humans negatively by having an, a, an impact on fishing. But we really don't know why it creates these stalks and, and so much of it. And so the goal of this project is to determine why Didymo creates its stalks and also to identify viruses that could be affecting Didymo. 
So here I have a graph that shows the uh, frequency of blooms on the y-axis and the phosphorus concentration on the x-axis. And you can see that Didymo blooms really, really well under low phosphorus uh, conditions. And so that's the basis for the first hypothesis that is maybe Didymo creates these blooms as a result of low nutrient availability. And the reason why they might do that is because they can stay tethered to a rock, but they can rise up further in the nutrient in, in the water column where there's greater nutrient availability. So to test this hypothesis, Dr. Taylor conducted a study in Colorado at a bunch of different streams with Didymo present, either blooming or not. And we have here the five treatments on the left. The one that we're gonna focus on right now is bloom versus bloom plus phosphorus added. Um, and this shows the differential gene expression of those two conditions using next generation gene sequencing. And if you look at the fourth column number of diatom transcripts, that's the, the one that we wanna focus on. And that shows the differential expression between the, uh, the diatoms in each condition. And so you can see for this first condition, there is zero differential expression between the two groups, which is kind of surprising because we expected there to be something based on the, the amount of phosphorus, uh, but there really wasn't. So that's evidence against the hypothesis that the phosphorus is causing these blooms. And there's more evidence as well. This also shows that the biovolume of the rocks not created is really no different in the phosphorus enriched condition versus a reference. So we can see that phosphorus really doesn't have an effect on, um, on the blooming. But we also see here that the enrichment did have an effect on the didymo. Um, they did take up the phosphorus. It just wasn't present in the gene expression. And this just shows that there wasn't an issue with the experimental design. It was just, they didn't change their gene expression. So to determine what it really is that's causing these blooms, we also looked at the third condition here, which is bloom versus non-bloom. And this one is important because you can see what the difference is between a population that's blooming and one that's not, and see kind of what, the, uh, what made the blooming condition decide to bloom maybe. And so here you can see that there is a lot of differential expression between these two conditions. And that is also seen here. These are some graphs that show the, which genes are upregulated and downregulated. On the left, we have cellular components. And on the right, we have uh, biological processes in the bloom community versus the non-bloom community. And I know that this is a lot of information and the words are kind of small, but I just want to focus on a few sections here. We have on the left, chlor chloroplast stroma, light harvesting complex, chloroplast thylakoid membrane. These are all things involved in, um, in photosynthesis and associated with the chloroplast. And these have all been downregulated, which is significant because the chloroplast is what, what a lot of plants use to defend against viruses. And so this is evidence that it could be a virus affecting Didymo because if you were a virus, you would want to shut down the kinds of things that could fight against you. And then over here on the right, we have some things that have been super upregulated. And these are all metabolic processes which are associated with energy. And that's also evidence for a virus because viral replication requires a lot of energy from the host cell. And then here's some more evidence for 
a virus. This is from the gene expression as well. We have some direct evidence from the viral capsid and viral RNA genome replication. We also have uh, sexual reproduction has been upregulated. So Didymo can reproduce asexually, but it can also reproduce sexually. And this is evidence for a virus because if you reproduce sexually, it'll increase the uh, genetic variation in a population, which can help def defend against viruses. We also have some general stress response here. One of these is upregulated, the other is downregulated. So this could be either the virus hijacking the cell and shutting something down. It could also be the cell turning something on to respond to the virus. Um, we have some more chloroplast genes here. And then everything else is associated with plant viruses in some way. Um, it could be either the virus is causing them or the cell is using these things to respond. But all of these things are, um, are associated with the viruses that have been found in plants. So the next step was to try to figure out what virus is present. And to do that, we did PCR. This is when I got involved with the project. I looked for a bunch of primers in, in a bunch of studies done by other researchers on diatom viruses. And we found some primers that we wanted to use, some general virus primers. And then we went to Dr. Tim Sitt's lab and performed PCR. Um, unfortunately, we didn't actually find any viruses in our samples. And the reason for that is because probably of the, the primers that we use, we use a lot of general primers and things for marine viruses. And so the next step, we still believe that there is a virus present because of the evidence in the gene sequence. But the next step would be to use the actual sequence from Didymo and the viral hits that we got in the gene sequencing to create our own primers and do PCR again. Um, and hopefully we would get something from that. So I want to acknowledge my advisor, Dr. Brad Taylor. Um, it was really great working with him. It was, it taught me a lot about biology. I learned a lot about research and I learned a lot about what I want to do in the future. Um, I also want to thank Dr. Allison Dickey for compiling a lot of the data that we use for this project and Dr. Tim Sitt for helping us with the PCR process. Great. Thank you so much, Ben. Uh, a question for you while other people are putting them together. Can you tell me a little bit more, tell us a little bit more about, um, you started to, to speak on this, but uh, more about the thinking of what you are going to do next, given where you ended up in this particular phase or what the lab is thinking about doing next. I think that's an interesting point that you've gotten to, um, to right now. Yeah, so unfortunately we just didn't have time to do it this semester. Um, but we did PCR with some primers that we had used, we found from general plant viruses, diatom viruses, and we were hoping that we would get a hit from one of those, but we didn't. Um, and so we want to do pretty much the same exact thing again, except this time use primers that we have designed from the, the gene sequence of viruses that we found in in the original data. And then we would be able to use that to, to identify whatever virus is in there. Thanks, Ben. And uh, Dr. Irwin has a question that she just put into the chat. Are diatom viruses typically species specific or might this potential virus infect multiple diatom species? Yeah, I believe that diatom viruses 
uh, can affect multiple species, which is why I was looking in, for the original primers, I was looking in a lot of, uh, a lot of papers that were on other diatoms because there wasn't a lot on, on Didymo. Um, so they can affect different diatoms, different species. Um, but it's also that I was looking at a lot of diatoms for um, marine species because there's just a lot more work done on them and this is a freshwater species. And so that could also play a, a role. Um, uh, it just happened that none of the ones we tested for affect Didymo. Thank you, Ben. Any other questions for Ben? All right. Well, thank you so much, Ben. It's an interesting uh, topic for the presentation and for your research. Thank you, everyone. Well done. All right. We will, um, I think we're right at time here to move on to our fourth and final presenter for our first session of the symposium this morning. I'm going to now introduce Sonia Pangare, and Sonia will be presenting on poop, pollen, and parasites, oh my. So great uh, title to end our first session. So I will now hand it over to Kate, uh, to Sonia, excuse me. Hi everyone. Uh, just give me a second to share my screen. Okay, so welcome everyone. My name is Sonia Pingari and I'm a senior majoring in zoology with minors in animal science and applied ecology. For my project, I collaborated with the Irwin Lab in the Department of Applied Ecology and worked with bumblebees and their poop, pollen, and parasites. So I'm sure everyone here has heard about all the recent news regarding the Save the Bees movement. Over the past two decades, we've seen widespread declines in bee populations, especially bumblebees, whose populations have experienced decreases in relative abundancy of up to 96%, as well as up to an 85% loss in geographic range. Um, but why should we all care about this? Well, bees are our biggest plant pollinators and pollination is integral to the growing of crops and food. Without bees to pollinate, we're likely to experience significant losses in crop production that could even lead to increased food security issues in the future. Um, without bees, we could experience losses in terms of agriculture and economic value that could have out outreaching effects into our daily lives. And some of the leading causes of these declines in bee species are going to be climate change, habitat loss, and parasites. The topic that I was most interested in was parasites, and so that's what I focused my research on. Uh, my research involved a bee parasite called Cuthidia bombi, which is a bumblebee parasite um, that lives in the guts of bumblebees. It is a protozoan trisoma, and it transmits fecal orally, um, which means that bees are infected when they ingest the poop of other bees. While the parasite by itself is not fatal, um, we have seen that researchers um, have seen that, they, that the bees experience decreases in foraging abilities and reproductive success. Um, infected worker bees are seen to have increased morality rates by up to 50% and queen bees um, have significantly lowered probability when it comes to the formation of new colonies. So especially in combination with factors like climate change, um, we're seeing that additional stressors can actually increase the um, fatality of these parasites and have significant effects when it comes to colony survival and reproduction. Um, but all hope is not yet lost. We've also discovered that the ingestion of sunflower pollen significantly reduces the infection of Crithidia. What we haven't yet fully discovered is how the sunflower pollen causes this effect. One of the um, theories is that there is a physical cause. Um, so compared to the buckwheat pollen on the right, we can see that the sun flower pollen has a spiky texture and it's believed that the spikiness of the sunflower pollen has a scarring effect and it physically removes the crithidia from the inside of the bumblebees intestines. Um, another thing that we haven't yet figured out is, um, is how the crithidia are affected by the uh, sunflower pollen. We have seen that bees poop more due to the sunflower pollen, but we're not yet sure if the crithidia are killed or harmed in any way, and whether being excreted from the bees um, through the sunflower pollen inhibits their ability to infect a new host at all. 
And so that's what I wanted to focus my project on. So um, to my research question ended up being, how is the fecal oral transmission um, of Crithidia bombi affected by the consumption of sunflower pollen in bumblebees? Um, and my hypothesis was just based off my personal belief that the sunflower pollen does inhibit um, or harm the uh, Crithidia in some way. I hypothesized that bees inoculated with the sunflower uh, fecal inoculum would have lower infection rates and lesser parasitic load compared to those inoculated with the buckwheat pollen. The buckwheat pollen served as our control during this experiment because it has the same nutritional composition as the sunflower pollen, just without like that spiky outside texture. And we also wanted to use this experiment as um, a way to just to test preliminary trials in order to evaluate methods for further research in this field. So um, in terms of methods, um, the total course of our experiment ran over 16 days. Uh, on day zero of the experiment, we collected 42 bees from three different colonies and inoculated them using our usual lab protocol. After that, the bees were transferred into individual micro colonies and given seven days to readjust their environment. Uh, on day seven, they reached peak infection, and then we switched them over to either their new diets of sunflower pollen or the controlled buckwheat pollen. And each of these treatment received 21 bees. The bees were given their new pollen for two days, and then on day nine, we collected feces from the bees and then created new inoculums made from those feces. Um, each of the inoculum uh, inoculums was standardized to be 1,200 um, cells per microliter in sucrose. And then uh, we had our round two of bees. So that same day, day nine, we collected 60 new bees from three different colonies and then fed 30 of them the sunflower pollen and then 30 of them the uh, buckwheat pollen. The bees then were allowed to again sit for seven days to allow the infection to fester. And then on day 16, we dissected all of our 60 bees, uh, collected their guts, and then counted the Crithidia cells in those bees, uh, in those guts using a hematometer. So here are just some pictures of that process. Um, this picture over here is going to be a micro colony setup. Um, over on the left side, um, we have our pollen and then also the sucrose that each bee was given. And we switched out the pollen and the sucrose every other day throughout the course of our experiment. Uh, this red tinted picture right here is going to be a picture of me switching out the pollen. It was an ordeal the first couple of times that I did it. So I was definitely a little nervous to be that close to bees, um, but bees are unable to see under red light, which is why this picture is red tinted. Um, over here at the bottom is a picture of how we did our sorting from the different colonies. Each bee was placed into a vial that was labeled with the colony that it came from and then sorted out over our different treatments. And then over here in the top right, you can see a wonderful picture of me pulling some guts out from a bee. Um, that was also very interesting to do. And then on the bottom uh, right hand side is going to be a picture of the hematometer and what it looks like under the microscope. So for our counting purposes, we counted each of the four corner squares of the hematometer and then the middle square. And then that count became our Cathidia count for that B. So um, just before we jump into results, I just wanna reiterate that my hypothesis was that the bees fed the sunflower fecal inoculum would have lower infection rates and lesser parasitic load. Um, however, looking at the box plot over on the right hand side, we can see that this was not the case. I failed to reject my null hypothesis since the um, average of the sunflower bees was actually higher than the average of the buckwheat control bees. Um, and the p-value that I found for this was 0 0.084. Another interesting thing that I noticed while I was playing, out, uh, playing around with my data was that there was actually sig uh, statistical significance between the three different colonies that we pulled from in terms of infection. Uh, so specifically colonies A and C had a statistical significance that showed that there might have been colony wide resistance um, in terms of the Carthidia infection and the p value that I got for that was 0 0.001. So in a larger context, what does this mean? Even though I failed to reject my null hypothesis, it, um, it could, doesn't necessarily mean that there is no difference in the fecal oral transmission. Um, the sunflower pollen we're still investigating and it might still be having some kind of a chemical or physical effect that may hinder the Crithidia from affecting. Um, we're just not 100% sure yet. 
Um, but touching on a subject that I also mentioned earlier, this could mean that the increase in the volume of feces from these bees could potentially lead to more clitidia infections. And that's definitely a source of study that I would wanna pursue in the future. Um, and we're again, not really sure exactly what mechanisms are playing into how the sunflower pollen is affecting the clitidia. In terms of other feature directions, I also want to explore the effects of time frame on the sunflower pollen. So previous research states that consumption for seven days is the most effective at reducing infection. So um, one of the problems that we incurred was only having the bees be fed their new diets of sunflower or buckwheat for only two days. So it could be possible that feeding them for seven days might help to um, show more of the results that we were looking at. It would also be interesting to stagger how long the bees are fed the pollen. So have some bees fed two days, some fed three days, five days, and seven days, just to see if um, that time frame has any effect on the infection of Crithidia. Um, another point that I also touched on earlier was that there was a difference between the counts for different colonies. Um, we expected this, which is why we pulled bees from three different colonies, just to account for um, any colony-wide resistance. But in the future, it would definitely be interesting to investigate what factors um, affect colony-wide resistance and whether this is something that is genetically driven, environment, environmentally driven, or if there are factors from both that are affecting this. And then just in general, in terms of the bigger picture of ecology, we're still figuring out how to use these applications and um, actually help wild bee populations. Um, is this just a matter of simply planting more sunflower or are there other more effective methods of kind of using these results to decrease parasitic load in wild bumblebees? And then just for acknowledgments, um, a big shout out to my mentor, April Sharp. She was fantastic during my entire presentation and there for me every step of the way. And then also shout out to Levi and Kristen, who are our research assistants and our lab managers in the urban lab. They were wonderful when it came to management of the many, many bees that we had over the course of experiment. And then finally, thank you to Dr. Irwin, our uh, PI, who let me work on this project and also be in this lab with these wonderful people. And that is it for me. Um, I'm free to take any questions now. Thanks so much, Sonia. While people are writing in questions, I noticed that you had used BioRender to develop some um, images. And actually, uh, Dr. Irwin has a question about us very quickly. I, I noticed that you had developed some images that were really nice. And um, it made me wonder if you had any plans to uh, engage a public audience with this work? And if so, what audiences might be most interested in the research that you conducted? Um, I definitely think that public outreach is big when it comes to any kind of like scientific development. So it would definitely be interesting to pursue um, some kind of like outreach through pictures or images. As for the audience I would wanna target, I feel like, um, students my age or researchers in like this field would be the best people. And I also think it might be important to uh, even stretch that out further to like the general public, um, especially in terms of like citizen science and things like that. It could be beneficial to see um, what kind of research everyone else can do in terms of like ecological developments in this field too. And thank, then, you. thank you, Sonia. I think Dr. Irwin has a question. So um, did the number of Cathidia cells in the feces differ between bees fed the sunflower um, versus buckwheat pollen? Um, yes, they actually did differ. Um, from what I can remember, we collected more feces from the buckwheat pollen bees, which I also thought was interesting since the sunflower bees were the ones that were theorized to poop more. Um, but we actually found a higher crithidia count within the buckwheat pollen bees than we did the sunflower uh, pollen bees. I believe that um, we collected about 580 from the total volume that we had in buckwheat, but only about 500 from the total volume that we had in the sunflower uh, pollen. Thank you, Sonia. Any other questions for Sonia? Thank you, everyone. 
Yes, thank you so much, Sonia. And thank you everyone for joining us this morning for our first session of the symposium. We do have a second session later this afternoon. It starts at 2.30 p.m. and you can register um, the same way you did for this session. We hope you'll join us. And at this time, I'd just like to um, lead a, a round of applause or at least a virtual round of applause for our excellent student presenters. Thank you for all the work you put into your presentations this morning, as well as to uh, your projects over the course of the last semester. Job well done to everyone. So thank you. And um, we'll go ahead and, and sign off now, but look forward to seeing everyone later this afternoon. Great work, everyone. Thank you.